scripture this morning, God's word for us, invites you to hear our prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word, and give us grace that we may clearly understand and freely choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So as we've been moving through the Old Testament, and last week we were in the book of Deuteronomy, we have moved on past um, the book of Judges, and we are now into the book of Ruth. So this morning we hear Ruth's story, and we begin with just a portion of it from Scripture in Ruth 1, verses 1 through 19. I'd like you to hear God's word for us this morning. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orba, and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malone and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and sat on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her God. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me. Be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem, and when they arrived there, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? And our New Testament reading is a few verses in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 31 to 35. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? Jesus asked. 
And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is God's holy word for us this day. Our story this morning actually begins in Bethlehem with the family of Elimelech and Naomi, who were part of a long line of biblical, historical, and even contemporary households facing food insecurity. People with nowhere to flee, watching their land turn barren, and having few options in the midst of famine. Some walk miles, take risks, and cross into unfamiliar lands, attempting to survive the dangers present and daring to hope that they might have a future. Abraham and Sarah and their household fled to Egypt to escape famine in Canaan. During a later famine in Canaan, Jacob, his wives, his children, and grandchildren relocated to Egypt to survive. Here, Elimelech, an Israelite, has migrated with his wife and his two sons during a famine in Bethlehem to Moab. Bethlehem and Moab are on opposite sides of the Dead Sea. Relocation to Moab provided relief from the famine, but it did not protect the family from other disasters. Elimelech dies. His sons marry Moabite women, and after living in the land 10 years, both sons also die. We learn that Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Sadly, Naomi is not unique among ancient or contemporary refugee women in having their lives turned upside down by emotional, social, and economic loss, and having to figure out how to continue to live. It's not surprising that Naomi, having heard that the famine was over in her homeland, would decide to return to Bethlehem, her hometown. Exploring Ruth and Naomi's story this morning stretches across 30 years, covering the time frame following the death of Ruth's father-in-law, brother-in-law, and husband, to Ruth caring for Naomi as they travel back to her native land of Bethlehem, to meet the meeting of Boaz, next of kin to Naomi and Ruth's deceased husband. We encounter three women, all widows, who are starting all over setting out to leave behind their lives of loss. The two daughters-in-laws are leaving behind their families, their homeland, to follow their mother-in-law back to her homeland. We do not know how far the three women traveled together out of Moab before Naomi directs her daughter-in-law to go back. Go back to your mother's house. Naomi shares that her concern is for their security, which rests in the house of your husband, and which Naomi, who has no living sons, cannot provide. Naomi prays that these two Moabite women will be treated by her God, Yahweh, with the same loyalty and devotion that they have extended to the dead and to her. Orpah is dutiful to Naomi's request and turns around to head back to Moab. We hear nothing more of Orpah after she turns around. We know only that she makes her choice and returns to her hometown of Moab. Ruth, however, is resistant to Naomi's request. Both daughters-in-law face uncertain futures. Both are acting out of devotion to Naomi. The law expected Ruth to do the same thing that Orpah did. But Ruth chooses to go against her own self-interest to follow Naomi. Ruth goes above and beyond the law and the expectations. She makes a stunning pledge 
to link her life to Naomi, to Naomi's homeland, her people, and her God. As a foreigner, a Moabite, and as a widow without property, will she find welcome support for this commitment? Will there be ways in the economic and social structure of her new homeland for her to find security for Naomi and her own future well-being? Into all of these unknowns, Ruth follows Naomi to Bethlehem. We follow too, with Naomi, an Israelite from Bethlehem, a widow and now childless, traveling back to her own town with her daughter-in-law Ruth, a Moabite, having been born and raised in Moab, a region known for its idolatry and non-Jewish ways, a region in constant conflict with Israel on the other side of the Dead Sea. The adventure begins with these two women, two widows related through marriage, both mourning, with nothing to lose by starting over in a new place. Since Naomi's responses to Ruth continuing to follow her were left out of the scripture, we turn to the Jewish Midrash, the filling in of the gaps of the story by the rabbis. The conversation between the two women might have been when Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Naomi might have responded, that Jewish women have different practices. There were places unclean or unfit for an Israelite woman. To this, Ruth responded that she would simply follow Naomi's example. Where you go, I will go. Naomi might have told her that she would live in a house that had a Jewish mezuzah on the door, and Ruth replied, wherever you stay. I will stay. And when Ruth said, your people will be my people, she was saying, I will leave all idolatry behind. And with your God will be my God, Ruth expressed her dependence on the God of Israel alone. Ruth chooses to follow Naomi, travel with her to Bethlehem, live in a Jewish home, practice their customs and traditions as well as follow Yahweh, the God of Israel. Ruth makes the decision to give up everything. Her culture, her people, her language, even what she believes in, because of her love and faithfulness, hesed in Hebrew, to her mother-in-law. She was being open to being completely changed by Naomi's God and Jewish way of life. So two widows with no male to care for them, to provide for and protect them, or even to give them a home, set out on their own, headed to a place with no promise of renewing even a small piece of what they both have lost. Remember that widows were considered homeless by today's standards. They had no right to property or to even earning wages no rights whatsoever. It was up to male family members to care for widows. A brother would be expected to marry his brother's widow to care for her and provide an heir to carry on the family name. Yet that was not an option for any of our widows of this story, prompting Naomi to return to her people where she could at least live among them and hope that someone would take her in. These two women have found hope in each other as they arrive in Bethlehem, and Naomi is recognized by family and friends. While Naomi and Ruth have arrived without a plan or a clue as to what life will look like in Bethlehem, God has a plan. They seek shelter, and Ruth sets out to glean at the edge of the field gathering the grain that has been dropped and left lying on the ground. This must have been humiliating. Only the poor scavenge for food, and it's a dangerous task for a woman by herself in a field with a questionable character of the reapers. However, 
God provides the field of Boaz, Naomi's relative, where Ruth's gleaning efforts are protected and even safely provided for her. Ruth returns to Naomi at the end of each day, probably to a cave or outcropping on Elimelech's, Naomi's late husband's property, with a bushel of barley. What faithfulness. And faithfulness is at the root of Ruth's story. Hesed is the Hebrew word closest to faithfulness, meaning love in action or covenant love. Ruth shows great hesed in her relationship with Naomi. To follow her to Bethlehem to help her find shelter, to provide for her from the fields, to faithfully care for her mother-in-law. Naomi plays her part in God's plan when she tells Ruth, Blessed be the man who took notice of you. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. That man is our close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. At this point, we discover the accepted customs of the day when Naomi requests that Boaz exercise his rights as kinsman redeemer. In a tribal culture like Israel, family members were expected to take care of relatives. The next of kin, a male, played an especially important role in Israel as the kinsman redeemer. He could be expected to fill three specific duties. First, to redeem property and or relatives and to pay off debts and redeem the land or the relatives. Second, to provide an heir through marriage so the inheritance was maintained and the family name carried on. Third, to avenge the unlawful death of a family member serving as the legal function of justice. So Naomi, thinking that Boaz was the next of kin or the nearest kinsman of the family, called upon him to fulfill the duty of that relationship. So Boaz tried to fulfill this role for Ruth by first checking with the first kinsman whom Boaz approaches at the gates of the city. When the kinsman with first rights, not Boaz, and those obligations makes the decision to not accept full rights to the property belonging to Malam, Ruth's deceased husband, or Alamelech, her father-in-law. Boaz's devotion and faithfulness, his hesed, is rewarded by God. Boaz also goes above and beyond the laws and expectations. He goes to the gates of the city before the elders, publicly accepting the land of Milan and taking Ruth as his wife. The gracious foreigner, Moabite, and stranger in Bethlehem becomes the wife of the rich landowner and kinsman redeemer, Boaz. By her perseverance and faithfulness, her chesed, Ruth had achieved the seemingly impossible. Her life is totally changed. She moves from widowhood and poverty to marriage and wealth. In the first part of Ruth's story, her love and hesed is demonstrated by following Naomi and caring for her. And in the second part, Ruth's love and hesed is rewarded with a new life. All of it part of God's plan, living out God's love. Ruth and Boaz have both given up much, however, making major life-changing decisions. Ruth chose to risk her own future to care for her widowed mother-in-law, giving up everything she knew. Boaz chose to help, protect, and eventually marry this impoverished and foreign widow. Their decisions both form the framework of the story to come. The story's real heart lies in the faithfulness, love in action that motivated their decisions. In every detail, in every action, we see kindness, 
loyalty and faithfulness. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Jacob. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, who Tamar bore to Jacob's son Judah. And it was so. God blessed Ruth and Boaz, and from this marriage was born a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given birth. They named the child Obed, meaning servant or in its full form, possibly, servant of the Lord. Obed would become the father of Jesse, the father of David, who would one day become king. From his birth, Obed assured both his parents and his grandmother that his name would be famous in Israel. Love and faithfulness had worked a miracle in Ruth's life. She had provided that love in action and can, can lift one out of poverty and the lowest position in society. Esed can bring forth a wonderful child. And she proved that covenant love can shed its rays like sunlight on all whom it touches even a forlorn and weary mother-in-law. Ruth's love and hesed had even penetrated the barriers of race and acceptance. Ruth, a foreigner, an outsider, would be accepted by God's people and by Israel's God. It is interesting that Ruth continues to be called a Moabite, Yet she is fully accepted as part of the family of God, her mother-in-law's God, and her new husband's Lord, and now her Yahweh. God accepted Ruth, God blessed this foreign woman from Moab, and God even used her as the great-grandmother of King David to bless all of Israel. The message then and now if God accepts and loves foreigners such as Ruth, all of Israel should surely do the same, and so should we. The most direct and obvious message of the story is that love, loyalty, faithfulness, and kindness are the ways to happiness. Both Ruth and Boaz were loving, loyal, faithful, and kind. Both were richly blessed by God. God is a God of love. God is loving, loyal, faithful, and kind, and wants us to be the same. This account of an Israelite widow and her Moabite daughter-in-law highlights a new and emerging theme in the story of the Bible. God's saving purpose is not for Israel alone. God has been particular, calling a chosen people to serve, saving a nation and delivering them as God's people, saving them again and again over 350 years of ups and downs. God called a particular man, Abraham, out of the surrounding culture to follow and obey. God called a particular nation and gave the nation of Israel laws and commandments to govern life and worship. But God's purposes ultimately are bigger and broader than the success of a single nation. God has picked this particular people, God's chosen people, 
to play a part in God's ultimate gift of God's very own son. How else could a Moabite woman become the great-grandmother of King David? The importance of Ruth and Boaz lives in what they were. They were people of God who lived a life of hesed, and God blessed them greatly. God also blessed Israel and all the world through them because these two chose to live their lives with kindness, loyalty, faithfulness, and love. A family line would follow through to King David and on to the birth of the Savior Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Mark reminds us how important the family of God is. Jesus his words remind us that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Membership in God's spiritual family shown by following the Lord, like Ruth and Boaz, is more important than even our human family. We belong to the family of God. And how expansive God's love is that Ruth, who gleaned in the fields of Boaz, was accepted, chosen, and blessed. Though she was both widow and foreigner. And how appropriate that Ruth found God in Bethlehem where later the gift of God's Son would be given through the house and the lineage of her great-grandson, David. May it always be so. Amen.